Mr. Mike Huckabee has been serving as the 44th governor of the state of Arkansas from the year 1996 to 2007. He was running twice in the United States for the office of the President of the United States in 2008 and this current election season in 2016. He is hosting a, a news show on Fox News Channel in the United States called The Huckabee Show. And most importantly, he's a great friend of the state of Israel. He's a devout Christian, Christian. He's a pastor, he's a musician, and he loves the Jewish people. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please help me to welcome His Excellency, the governor of the state of Arkansas, Mr. Mike Huckabee. Well, thank you very much. I want to uh, express my extreme pleasure for the invitation to be here. I feel like I might be like the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, who uh, really wasn't invited to speak the first time and never got invited back. So I hope that that won't be quite the case. A little background perhaps would be in order. My first trip to Israel was in 1973. I was 17 years old, it was 43 years ago, and from that time forward, I have had an extraordinary love of this country, its people, its culture, its future. And I've been back dozens of times. I've been here during Intifada. I've been here during peaceful times. My wife and I came intentionally during the conflict with Gaza back in 2014 because we wanted to show our solidarity with the people of Israel, especially when we felt like that there were some very unfair things happening, in particular the cessation of flights to Israel at a time when it was perfectly safe to fly into Israel. And I got off an airplane and went directly to the home of Rachel Frankel, the mother of Naftali Frankel, in June of 19 or of 2014, to express my support. At that time, we did not know the outcome. Later, of course, we did, and it was not a good one. In all of those times to Israel, the one thing I've noticed through 43 years of traveling here is the remarkable pathway that this nation has made. I have seen biblical prophecy fulfilled. The dry bones have come to life, and the desert has come to bloom. And no one can deny that. In many ways, what I want to say today is that America is looking into the mirror and it sees Israel because both countries were created by people who were escaping a galloping terror of totalitarianism and religious persecution, wanting to create a life of freedom, but also a life of enlightenment and education and advancement, and both have succeeded. Today, I recognize that every friend of Israel is a friend of the United States and every enemy of Israel is an enemy of the United States. We have so much more in common. That was the sound of one hand clapping if you ever wanted to know the definition. I will speak very candidly and frankly today, I realize my time is limited, so let me jump right in. There is a foe that we commonly face. The greatest threat to civilization today is the radical Muslim ideology that would take us back to the seventh century and to kill anybody who disagrees with that. It's a regressive worldview, and it's a worldview that actually believes that we should not have education and revelation nor should we have individual freedoms and liberties. In America, one of the big topics is, is there a war on women? Well, I can tell you there is a war on women, but it's not being waged by Republicans. The ultimate war on women is being waged by radical Islam who would seek to subjugate women, not to allow them to have an education, to subject them to female mutilation, to restrict even so much as their attire and to make them forego any level of individuality 
and be under the absolute control of a father or a husband. Radical Islam is a threat to all civilization because it wants to deny and suppress such things that we tend to take for granted, things like art and architecture, music, and even our individual sense of who we are. We may have fierce disagreements with each other. I know that that's not true among Israelis. Israelis agree on everything. I've been here enough to know that there's no controversy at all. Actually, what I tell people in, back in the States is that if you think our politics is rough, you ought to come to Israel. These guys know how to fight. But the fact is, we have a common enemy, and that common enemy is radical Islam that wishes to destroy civilization itself and turn the clock back to centuries ago. We've had a horrific incident in America this past weekend with the murders of 49 people in Orlando. The argument over whether or not it is terror or hate crime is really nonsensical because the fact is, while there are some things that are hate that are not terror, all terror is based on hate. I, I fear that sometimes we are afraid to call out the common enemy of radical Islam because we're afraid it might offend somebody. Let me be clear. I'm offended when innocent people are murdered, whether it's the four people who were murdered in Tel Aviv last week or the 49 who were murdered in Orlando or those who were murdered at the Boston Marathon or in San Bernardino. I'm offended when people are cold, bloodedly killed in the name of an ideology that wishes to destroy any semblance of peace, any semblance of civilized behavior. I know that there was a lot of angst in Israel because I was here during the time just before your prime minister who will be speaking tomorrow, I understand. When he came to the United States to address a joint session of Congress and he spoke out boldly about what was an ill-fated and tragic deal to trust the Iranians that they really weren't going to use their growing nuclear capacity to weaponize it. I told people in Israel when I was here, and I will tell you now, that there are many of us in America who greatly appreciate the candor and the courageous nature of his remarks to remind all of us, not as conservatives or liberals, but as freedom-loving people, that there can be no deal with those who believe that it is okay to murder people because of their religion, because of their faith, because of their ethnicity. And that certainly would mean that it is unacceptable in every way for us to ever enter into any arrangement with the current government of Iran. It is disastrous, it is dangerous, and I hope and pray that that deal will be rescinded. I wanna to speak to the folly of the fight we're in because I know that there are a lot of good intentioned people and I, I, I really respect the fact that there are folks who will strongly disagree with me and that's fine, that's why we're here. But having come here for 43 years and been an observer and been to vote most every Middle Eastern country from Iraq and Afghanistan and from Turkey, even to Syria, to Lebanon, to Egypt, to Jordan, to Qatar and many other of the Middle Eastern nations, I will tell you, when I hear people say, and I, what I'm about to say I realize is politically incorrect and it is not a statement of, of diplomatic uh, certainty, but the idea that there's going to be what is often referred to as a two-state solution, I, I believe is naive. Because there cannot be a two-state solution unless both sides agree that the other side has a fundamental right to exist. And until that happens, and until there is no longer schools who teach children to celebrate the death of Jews, there is no solution that involves two people holding for the same piece of real estate. 
I was greatly offended during the conflict with Gaza when there were attempts to bring moral equivalency to the two sides. That was and remains to be nonsense. While the Israelis were putting their soldiers in front of the baby carriages, in Gaza they were putting the baby carriages in front of their soldiers. That is not moral equivalency. I went to the southernmost air base in Israel and I spent a day with the IDF Air Force. I was briefed on the extraordinary measures that were being taken to try to absolutely minimize any civilian deaths. And it was frankly remarkable what the Israeli Air Force were, were, was doing in order to take every step possible to keep from collateral damage. Knowing our own Air Force protocol, I must tell you that no one on Earth, not even the United States military, as ethical as I believe we try to be, could say that we were taking the same level of steps to protect innocent civilian life. And I only could have wished that we could have seen that on the part of Hamas, but we didn't and we never will. And that's why we cannot pretend that there's some magical formula that is going to happen unless there is an addressing of the serious fundamental issue in which radical ideology seeks not to respect another view or to coexist with, but only wants to destroy and celebrates every time that someone on the other side is murdered. When chocolates are passed out in the streets to celebrate the death of a Jew in Israel, there's something terribly wrong with the way children are being raised in that culture. I'm not pretending that Israel is perfect, because it isn't. Neither is the United States. But I recognize that in both of our countries, we do have a system of laws, and we insist that we abide by them. And we insist that people are held accountable when they violate them. And we do not celebrate the violation of them. And we do not teach our children in our schools to ignore them and to take some level of extraordinary pleasure in killing people. And we certainly don't name streets and make heroes out of terrorists. There can be no solution until there is a moral equivalency and quite frankly, as of right now, there simply is not. Israel has made extraordinary efforts to try to bring peace. Even though it operates on only one-eighth of one percent of the land mass of the entire Middle East, there are always going to be calls for Israel to give up more land. And if you give up more land, you'll get more peace. But historically, that has not been the case. Because this is not a conflict about land, nor is it a conflict about power. It's a conflict over existence. And of all the nations on Earth, I think Israel should clearly understand an existential threat. And it's why the so-called deal with Iran is so utterly unacceptable and should never be accepted, tolerated, or continued. I also want to say that the notion that Jerusalem should be divided is other nonsense, in part because there is only one nation in the history of the world that has ever claimed Jerusalem to be its capital, and that's Israel, the only one. To have two people trying to divide that great historic and holy city, a city that was never even mentioned in the Quran, so it can't be deemed that it somehow is a very special holy city based in the teachings of the Quran because it was never mentioned there. I, I think at some point we have to come to grips that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Not because it has been since 1948, but it has been for 3,000 years. And it needs to be res respected and accepted. The so-called BDS movement is an anathema to peace itself. And it's one of the most irrational things that has happened on our planet because 
the idea of boycott, divestiture, and sanctions against the Israelis makes no sense whatsoever. It is irrational and illogical, especially in light that many, even U.S. corporations, would seek to punish Israel at a time when it is trying to bring economic capacity even to those who are Arabs within the borders of, of Israel. I've been to Ariel, I've been to factories, I've talked to the workers without anyone around and said, look, nobody's listening, tell me. And I had Arab workers tell me they'd never been treated so well. They made four times the amount of money that they would have made in any job in the PA. And they had health benefits. And they worked alongside Israeli Jews. And they got along fine. I was at the Soda Stream plant in Judea, and the same thing. I saw people working side by side, Muslim Arab women next to Israeli Jewish men in the factory, and it worked. But the pressure of the BDS movement, which should remove the D and just be called the BS movement, has created an untenable situation for helping to bring about the very thing that could provide some level of understanding, and that's economic capacity and opportunity. What I do not understand is some of the corporations that want to punish Israel, who has taken extraordinary means to provide economic opportunity, are the very ones who also will do business and make lots of money working with Muslim countries who believe that all people who are gay should be put to death, or they believe women should be mutilated, or that it is okay to subjugate them, not allow them to drive or go to school. That level of inconsistency needs to be called out and not tolerated and not accepted. I want to mention that there is a fix that I believe we must forge. And I conclude by just saying that we have to recognize that if it's good for Israel, it's really ultimately good for the United States. If it's good for the United States, it's good for Israel. Because the similarities of our country are too glaring to ignore. I've lost count of the number of trips that I've made to Israel over the past 43 years. I know that I've been here a lot more than most of my Jewish friends have. I sometimes tell them a whole lot of things about Israel that they never knew. One of my Jewish friends asked me one time, he says, I don't understand you, you guys who are, who are Christian. Why is it that, that you love Israel, you respect Israel, you support Israel? And I said, it's really not that hard. Let me explain it. I said, it's very possible to be Jewish and have no connection to a Christian. But it is impossible to be a Christian and not be completely connected to the Jewish faith because everything that our faith is built upon is the Jewish faith. And there's an absolute connection, the entire Old Testament. In fact, I have it on my lapel. It's in a nano Bible, the entire Old Testament. You can only read it under an electron microscope, but it's all there. Because everything that I hold to is built on what you believe. But in all my years of coming here, the many trips that I have made, the many times that I have been to Yad Vashem, the many times I've been to Masada, the one appreciation that I have before any is this, that there is a real sense that Israelis understand what it's like to be free and what it's like to not be free. A lot of Americans know what it's like to be free, but they are so far from understanding what it's like to not be free that maybe we don't appreciate it enough. The alliance that we have is too precious, too important to ever allow something to come between us. It is in our best interest to make sure that your freedom, your sovereignty, your security, your safety is protected because Israel is the first domino, but we're the next one. Anyone who attacks you is coming after us. And that's why I hope that one outgrowth from this conference will be a recognition that our countries can often fight and disagree, but they'd better stand together against the real threat that we commonly face, and that is the ideology of hate 
that wishes to destroy all of us. I thank you, and I wish you Godspeed. Thank you very much.